the term red tide has been around for many decades. And I think if you talk to people who live in Florida or the Northeast, they're very familiar with that term. But towards the end of the 20th century, scientists began to recognize, firstly, that these events, these red tides were becoming more and more frequent and occurring in more and more places. But then the second thing that we recognize is that events where you have a particular phytoplankton species that's either toxic to man or animals or causing some sort of ecosystem disruption, they're not always caused by phytoplankton that turn the water red. That is, in the case, for example, of oreococcus, turning the water brown, but it's also having a harmful effect on the ecosystem, just like the red tides were. And there's other phytoplankton, say, that are green, that are growing to great densities and having a negative effect on ecosystems. And there's yet other times where a species of phytoplankton grows and doesn't necessarily discolor the water. So because of these disparities, the term harmful algal bloom was developed during the 1990s to sort of encompass all of these different events. So, Oreococcus anaphragaferens is a marine phytoplankton, and it's well known for forming what we call brown tides in waters on the east coast of the U.S. and also in South Africa. The Oreococcus cells grow to great densities, billions of cells per liter, and when they do that, they harm the ecosystem. They're known to be toxic to shellfish because they grow so dense and they make the water so turbid They prevent light from penetrating in the water and therefore also can kill off aquatic vegetation. It plays a big role in carbon cycling, particularly in coastal ecosystems. I mentioned how dense these blooms get. When one of these blooms occur and you get a billion cells per liter, it represents milligrams of carbon per liter, which is much higher than you typically see in a coastal ecosystem. And we recognize that coastal ecosystems are important for exporting carbon to the deep ocean. Another thing that's of interest with this particular organism is the ability to actually also degrade organic carbon. And it seems that our genomic analysis revealed that it has a suite of enzymes that are important for degrading organic carbon that other phytoplankton species don't have. So it's doubly important for the carbon cycling, and that definitely sequesters a lot of carbon and exports a lot of carbon, but also has some unique metabolic capabilities for degrading organic carbon. Oreococcus had, firstly, a unique set of genes that weren't found in any of the other seven organisms, and then also seemed to be enriched in the genes that seemed to be important for the ecosystem. So just as a quick example, Oreococcus had 62 light harvesting genes, whereas its competitors had only, on average, a couple of dozen or, or in some cases, none whatsoever. The study that we've published, we've identified specific genes and gene sets that we have hypothesized are facilitating the success of this alga. So the next step is to look more carefully at these selected gene sets and to look In the ecosystem, are these genes, for example, being turned on or turned off during bloom events to, and and therefore might they be playing a critical role in the occurrence of these blooms?